welcome everyone to the second session of the conclave today. This is a panel discussion on the topic, navigating the multifaceted roles of legal educators, exploring effective practices. And for this discussion, we have illustrious academics with vast research and administrative experience to share their thoughts. I'll follow up with a brief introduction of our speakers. Our first speaker is Professor Devi Singh. He is the former director of IIM Lucknow and former VC Flame University Pune. He is recognized as an academic leader in India who has created and transformed institutions of higher learning. He has vast experience in international finance and management and has led multiple projects and consulting to leading Indian and multinational organizations. Our second speaker is Dr. Shashigala Gurpur. She is the director of Symbiosis Law School, Pune and Dean Faculty of Law, Symbiosis International Dean University, Pune. She is a distinguished academician with a career including a wide range of experience in teaching, research and industry. She is also considered a pioneer in European Union legal studies in India. Our third speaker is Professor Dr. Ruhi Paul, Registrar, National Law University, Delhi and also Professor of Law and Director of the Centre for Alternate Dispute Resolution here at NLU Delhi. Besides being an academician, she is also a trained mediator and certified arbitrator and she has been invited to offer comments and suggestions at the World, Bra World Bank Group's new initiative, Business Enabling Environment with respect to dispute resolution. Our next speaker is Professor Shubhra Jyoti Gupta. He is an associate professor at OP Jindal Global University. Prior to being an academician, he has practiced as an app appellate litigator, primarily in the Supreme Court of India and also the Delhi High Court. As an academic, he has published widely in areas of commercial law, arbitration and international trade law. Lastly, our moderator for today is Ms. Suhasini Rao. She is an attorney with over 17 years of experience in jurisdictions in public law and policy, corporate governance, legal tech and edutech products. She is also the founder director of Cube Roots Advisor Private Limited, a boutique consulting firm with an interdisciplinary approach to better governance and business management solutions. Ma'am will be moderating the session today. Over to you. Thank you so much. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here on a cold, wintry day. I hope today's discussion uh, in the course of today's seminar proves to be helpful to all our participants today. And thank you so much, all our members here, before we start. Um, I'm going to send out a couple of questions that I think um, have come up in the course of the discussion and putting together this uh, conclave. And I'd like to start off with uh, Professor Singh and asking him this first question. So if you don't mind, as somebody from a non-law-based background, but associated with the legal fraternity for pretty much the entirety of the career. What are the skills associated with learning law-based subjects that you see um, and, and are emphasized in non-law classrooms? Um, we would really like to hear your ideas on you know, different techniques or different ways in which non-lawyers are learning law-based subjects as well, so that we can also see what we can do in our classrooms. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure and lovely to be here. Uh, I think uh, as she started with a disclaimer, I am the only person who is not from law. But to me, uh, law is a, is a field of study and a profession that uh, most of us can relate uh, uh, easily other than the very technical side of it. Uh, see, first I look at the role of a teacher uh, in a professional program. I consider law as a professional program. Uh, so you have to be clear whether you are when you're teaching, are you teaching in a trade school or a purely a theoretical school or you are teaching in a professional school. So, so let's be clear about this distinction. Uh, and I, having been a teacher of management all my life, uh, I've always believed that uh, in, a, in any professional uh, program, uh, teaching has to be participant-centric. You have to first keep the student in the center and 
you have to take the role of a facilitator because you know this gone are the days and uh, I being a you know having been a student of IIM Ahmedabad and having taught in IIMs I think it was more like uh, we were just thrown into you know into a pool or into an ocean and we were uh, forced to swim uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is that a professor will come a day before he will tell us this is the case or this is the material we are going to review or going to discuss uh, so please read and prepare and we are just going to discuss and I tell you a course uh, called accounting where we didn't do ABC uh, we, the first day we were given a case of 30 pages. I think cutting this story short, and this was the case every day. The professor will come and say, well, uh, bef before uh, we start, or before Devi gives us a kick start, uh, he will just catch somebody. And uh, I just had a couple of points to make. And he never concluded the class, but that was in management. And that's how we learned accounting, by struggling, you know, working with each other, and understanding. So the first requirement is that a teacher cannot, you know, it's not a pedantic approach. You cannot be a sage on the stage. You have to involve students at every level. Uh, the second is you have to somehow, you know, work out a strategy where, uh, you know, we are all fond of his teachers, all fond of talking. We need to somehow, you know, create a framework where we don't talk for more than 50% of the time of the class. And the remaining 50% is, you know, if you want students to get engaged and learn whether law or any other, uh, you know, discipline, you need to kind of, you know, create that uh, curiosity and uh, interest. And uh, teaching is no more about uh, the, let's say, the content. Teaching is uh, in terms of raising issues, understanding the context, and trying to find a solution to a problem. So if you, I bring some of these to the law profession, I think when we teach law, the idea is that you want to inculcate the knowledge of uh, the principles of law and not necessarily the detailed rules. And for me to understand or for a student to understand law, I think it's better that we kind of create the right context because law laws are drawn based on our economic and social context, our political system, our constitution, okay, uh, political science and understanding of those, and and psychology understanding psychology and philosophy because if you look at the origin of law is the Roman rhetoric, you know, and somebody asked that question, what is, it, what is the role of art and culture? I was Vice Chancellor of Flame and the first principle of, or three pillars of liberal education are grammar, logic and rhetoric. Okay, so the point is, we'll understand law much better in the classroom if we understand the context and have more of a more of a multidisciplinary approach. I can't understand the contract law or the negotiation. I can, uh, you know, uh, and uh, the company law unless I understand the rules, the the principles of economics. How, you know, different sectors or how the economy works. Similarly, I cannot understand the international law and understand, I understand how the international economy works and what are the institutions. So I think we need to make it more broad based and uh, make it more, you know, participant centric. The unfortunate uh, problem with some of the law schools is for us to, like somebody said, that let's practice 
you know, after the first year, let's do all, you know, practice, uh, engage students in applying those laws. Those things work better in a more in a residential school uh, and not uh, so much in uh, in a school where you come in the morning, attend a class, and go back. So I think uh, as a teacher, my role is that of a mentor. My role is to enhance, open up your mind as a student and enhance your canvas so that you can connect. And, uh, and when you practice law, you know uh, that you have to follow the evidence, you have to follow all the principles, you have to be ethical, and you have to protect the law as well as the interests of your client. Thank you. That's a fantastic perspective. Thank you so much. You know, you mentioned something about uh, correlating theory with the practice, and that is something as an educator I've also noticed. Uh, we teach that uh, time is not of essence in a contract, and unfortunately in every commercial contract out there, time is very much of the essence. So the art and the skill of understanding the principle in the contract act and converting it into a fun functional clause uh, in a commercial contract is what I believe a classroom should be doing. Uh, which actually leads us to the next question which I have for uh, Dr. Gurpur. Thank you so much for being here with us today, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, as the long-standing director of Symbiosis Law College, you have seen many generations of both law students, graduates and educators come through the doors, right? Uh, in your opinion, how has the classroom experience changed over the years? What has been a fundamental shift, if at all, in the cl law classroom? So, uh, thank you and uh, welcome all the fellow law teachers and fellow panelists. Um, Quickly, I'll summarize when I took over in 2007, I had come with a full ground experience in NGO, in uh, National Law School, and then in corporate sector. So I asked the chancellor who told me immediately to go and take up this uh, task, and very rare for the woman to take up that at the age of 41. Um, I asked, what are your expectations? He said, revenue, reputation, excellence. Now, revenue, reputation, excellence. I saw only one thing, excellence. So if you want to achieve excellence, then learning has to be joyful experience. It has to rouse the curiosity. And the majority of the law schools, even though they call themselves as university, the core is undergraduate program, which prepares, as Sir rightly said, for the profession. If you are pro preparing these individuals, then I was thinking when I was teaching in Europe, Twining and Myers had written a book uh, on uh, how to do things with rules, legal rules. So they also had the, sung the glory of our very first national law school, where I happened to be the first woman tenured faculty, that it is the Harvard of the East. So I was wondering, what do they say about legal education? So Twining, William Twining uses a very interesting expression, Pericles, and he says, the plumber. Who is Pericles, the Greek philosopher, mm -hmm. in whose time the Athens had highest culture? <coughs> Somebody was asking about art and culture. And who is this uh, plumber? Plumber is somebody who does things with tools. Mr. Jet Malani used to say, a lawyer has to be a mason. A lawyer has to be an architect, not a mason. So I was thinking, uh, what what is the ideal approach, you know, as an accrual of all the experience, knowledge, uh, peer learning that I had gathered over those years when I started teach from when I started teaching law in a small town. So what I gathered was this Pericles was intellectual as per twining and the plumber was the practical knowledge, what we heard in the earlier panel in terms of relating to the context, you know. So I was thinking classroom set in the law school context and the law that is being taught is set in the context that Sir spoke about, then how does the teacher act as the intermediary, as the transacting uh, individual or medium? So uh, I was looking at that and then uh, it was during 2008 that we had the Carnegie report. Unfortunately, since morning I was expecting somebody to talk about it, which talks about educating lawyers. And the lament of the report is comparison to medical education, which is also training professionals like us, 
where there is a very clear commitment and values and skills transacted in legal profession, neither the ethics nor the skill are transacted. Knowledge, to some degree knowledge is transacted. So what should be the right proportion? So first thing I did was bringing all the faculty together and finding out how do we take this forward, creating a vision. So the first part of the vision was that all the faculty need to look at how they transact knowledge, how do they develop ethical sense in students, and how do they uh, narrow down the bridge between what is expected in the real world and what is done in the classroom. Thus was born our very innovative approach to the undergraduate program, which resulted, I mean, I'll tell you the figures also. I'm also a very business kind of person. Sir, uh, we had uh, 300 seats, and we had, 1, we had 1,500 applications for the program. By 2009, we created our own entrance examination because I thought that if you want to relate to the real world, as the earlier learned panelist said, you have to know what the real world is. So I was inspired by the experiment of Harvard Dean Margaret Mino, uh, Martha Mino, who, who went and met her Alvin and I, who were in different parts of the world, in different vocations. So should my training be vocational education, only gearing to the law firm and the court centric careers, or should it be for justice? So, Educating Lawyers Report of Carnegie laments that there is no concern for justice. It's not fair or just. Students don't come out with a sense of fairness and justice. So, I wanted to create a hybrid model where there was catering to all the needs, improving and uh, meeting the student expectations, improving the quality of the output, the quality circle talks about outcome-based education, the Malcolm Boyd model. So, uh, the efficiency of the business school or the business and the corporate approach and the structured approach of the corporate where there is highest accountability to the shareholder, the values of justice and fairness and a profound individual who is resilient, who is not deterred by any pandemic or any crisis and who stands with the poorest of the poorest, meekest of the meekest. So the classroom experience was uh, designed like this. Uh, so, in 2007, when we took over, the idea was to have the right mixture of knowledge, uh, skills and ethics. So, uh, some of my teachers were trained in Cardiff through the British Council program. So, we brought the idea of how our teaching, how our pedagogy in terms of teaching, how our content which goes into the class and how our assessment have to be aligned. And the next uh, level was coming with the second generation reform that Dr. Madhav Menon was talking towards the end of his life in terms of skilling because he said make profession ready lawyers. He used the word practice ready lawyers. I converted it as profession ready because here came the reality in India which is opening to prosperity by 2010-2014 which required multi-skilled lawyers. So we brought liberal education in, in terms of what we called as floating credits, mandatory to take those credits from other disciplines. So much before new education policy spoke, our law school had that because new education policy has kept legal education outside because we always lobby for an exclusivity and in this process we deprive our students from becoming the real leaders because ideally a lawyer should be the person in the society who doesn't know anything about anything, who knows every, something about everything, a generalist. And he is our legal education corresponding with that, the model that we have. But I must say today that all this freedom is available within the Bar Council rules. I was so fortunate by 2008, Bar Council of India rolled out a new set of legal education rules. And today I am hearing that there is a very good judge who is leading the team. So it is looking at modernizing that also. I hope it will modernize with what I am calling the next level of disruption, which was lurking in the background with Manupatra and others coming in by then. And I was so happy, I returned from abroad and I, I was always challenged by the students sitting in the library. Uh, you know, students also have neural diversity. Let's understand, this country has 80% people from rural areas, who 80% people who do not come from so well-to-do backgrounds and they come to the same law schools. There is one child who is able to take 20 cases in one hour. There is another child who can't take even two cases because his ancestors were in some place. There was no nutritional content that they had. So the DNA that is passed on, now it needs to be refurbished. So how do we enable that child? Technology. So for me, 
there was so much of promise in the technology that was coming. So in Symbiosis Hospital Pune, first thing we did was create an excellent computer lab because abroad we had, the lab is not just to resource Manupatra, it is also to see what is the reflective experience of that student. So Blackboard was a learning uh, infrastructure that we had. And I had a 14-room building, I must say. Today I have a five-acre campus. We earned it by our performance. So three crore revenue, uh, 1,500 applications. By 2010, went to 10,000 applications and touched almost 20 crores. And then what happens? We had to open a law school in Noida, and then we, demand was coming. Because they saw the graduates who were coming out, the uh, existing graduates who were in the third year, fourth year, were brought back to the class. When the classroom experience was magical, which made them, because that age group needs stimulation, they're all bright children, they are hungry for learning. So that was the model. But I was a traditional teacher, I was replicating what I learned from my professors from state university, etc. So I thought somewhere I need to soul search. So from the traditional model of teacher being a, we call it banking model, teacher being a bank of knowledge, we had to shift now to multiple sources of knowledge. So we brought law firms on board and all of our distinguished alumni are either leading or second leadership position. So we started bringing them. We got the professionals, Ram Jirmulani sir was the lead who was always standing by us as the professor emeritus. So this is how we got multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary uh, um, teachers as partners, what you said, collaborative learning experience for the students starting coming about we thanks to the bar council rule we integrated experiential learning in the form of internship but let me tell you all lawyers are not kind all don't have the time also to handhold and mentor the students so we created a structure that students had their own learning log now to facilitate this teachers had to mentor them so i tell you uh, we moved from the banking model of didactic and lecture based teaching to the seminar method of teaching where learning became student-centered, mm -hmm. whereby students became proud owners of their learning, they become responsible collaborators in learning. Now when that was progressing, again technology, because they were millennial generation, I was encountering my sons and children who were so tech savvy and here I was who was coming with this thin sheet of uh, overhead projector. Mm -hmm. So I had to train my teachers, there are some teachers who we, uh, our management provided computers to everyone. Some of them hadn't even dusted their computers. We forced them. We made them sit with younger students, younger teachers, and in a fun kind of experience, we made them tech savvy. The minute they became tech savvy, they realized the potential of so much knowledge at the click of the button. Teachers were joyous, students were joyous, and we started having a system whereby some portion, at least 10% of the portion, will be taught by the students. Where students will, these are all Dr. Menon's. Uh, very, very disruptive idea where he used to say, why you should wait for a PhD to teach or an LLM to teach? Why can't senior teachers, senior students teach juniors? So in that, we also integrated in the classroom experience, peer learning experience, whereby we incentivize that experience. This is again my guru's model, Dr. Menon's model. So humanizing legal education, classroom experience as an ethical and fairness experience, it is a speaking justice experience within the law school which we created. That's why this model worked. We opened another one in Hyderabad. By 2019, we were in Nagpur. So, uh, you know, the application numbers from one single uh, brand with four law schools getting 75% of the numbers of 27 national law schools. Tell me, this bias towards national law schools, uh, there must be some justification. It should not close your eyes to the greatest experiments which are happening, to the greatest of the talent that we have in recesses of India. So we adopted a university, at a, at a personal level I did that, went to a rural place, 90% Dalit girls and uh, girls from the below poverty area, and we were able to introduce research of the highest level there, not law, but transdisciplinary. But we made gender jurisprudence as mandatory curriculum there. I can't do that. Show me one law school which has mandatory curriculum on gender jurisprudence. I did a survey on human rights. Only Bangalore National Law School had uh, LLM, which is again optional. There is no mandatory course on human rights in a country which still has more than 80% of the people coming under legal aids definition, legal services definition. So with that in the background, I would say that the classroom experience transformation is not 
a single link in the chain. It has to be construed in the national context, global. This is what Dr. Menon said. When you envision, let the global vision be in front of you, national vision be in front of you. I know my nation needs to create wealth. It has to give dreams to my youngsters, who will be majority of the population in the next five years. So we were ready for that future. That's why our numbers escalated, revenue escalated, brand escalated, students walked out as most satisfied. They may not get a all 300 may not get a job, but all 300 are professionally. That I ensured. I told from day one. So five moots were introduced in the life cycle. Alternative dispute resolution was made the mandatory part of their training. And arbitration center, uh, arbitration ADR center was opened. Skills uh, center was opened. So step by step, we didn't stop. Because I always thought there is always a scope for improvement. Then comes the COVID. When COVID came, we took this challenge as an opportunity. So teachers are now trained in online learning. Uh, overnight, we were the first law school to roll out our examination, our classes online, I could say confidently in the country, along with us was Jindal, because we all made investment, heavy investment on technology from the beginning. And we familiarized our teachers and students, the whole faculty development program on online-based interactive methods, online-based peer support systems, because children were getting into depression. They were becoming lonely. They were happy to run home, but then again they felt they couldn't get out of the house, they couldn't go to market, they couldn't hang out with friends. So we, we took emotional well-being sessions. We made it mandatory for yoga and pranayama and all kinds of you know physical well-being. So finally, a classroom's uh, approach of a teacher is learner-centric and in defining the outcome in terms of the kind of learner as an outcome of the whole process with the attributes, graduate attributes that we want to attain, as ready for diverse multifarious legal careers which are emerging and not just judge-centric, court-centric, uh, lawyer-centric, but law firms now, different kinds of law firms thanks to the kind of innovation that profession is doing and professionals are doing. So that is how uh, we train and we have identified industry mentors as well for a group of students who make their uh, possible choices in the beginning, then somewhere in third year they shift their goalposts so as we shifted our goalpost from uh, the idea of uh, just excellence to the idea of Dr. Menon's clinical education, he always spoke about clinical, clinical, clinical. Finally, he was able to consolidate it as skills, very much sitting with the Carnegie report. So from clinical to coming through the skills and now coming to AI integration into teaching and research, that's where we have reached. So, Madam, that's why our teaching learning experience could be more and more learner-centric. Learner could assimilate because learner is faster than me as a teacher. So, this is what I would like to leave as the message. Thank so you. That's, that's very interesting, ma'am. Uh, what I'm hearing is that never stop experimenting in the classroom. Um, whatever it is that allows the student to really enjoy that 90 minute, 60 minute, you know, in the classroom and learn from that experience, never stop experimenting. Which is, I think, a, a great theme on which we move to uh, Dr. Paul. And uh, thank you again for being here with us today. Um, with your focus on ADR, ma'am, and alternative areas of practice, what do you think are the key skills that law students need to gather in a classroom uh, before they graduate? I mean, what is the vital takeaway Keeping in mind the uh, alternative areas of law, uh, not just your traditional court practice that a student needs to learn when they are exiting the course. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, my practice, I have practiced uh, in courts and I have uh, experience of ADR mechanisms and my graduation was in um, English honors. So all of this cumulatively has helped uh, in um, building a style of teaching um, which has a lot of ADR elements in it and I think these are also the skills uh, which a law student should have and, uh, and can work on to be a better legal professional. So uh, first thing, as a law teacher, um, uh, there are certain principles which I keep in mind while teaching is uh, the diversity, respect the diversity. So that means the choice, um, the choice 
should be because as ma'am was also talking about student centric approach so i think we should give a choice to the students as to how and what basically they want to do focus to to have a focus on during the semester or the year the year three system whichever is being followed uh, we can have these kind of experiments we we can obviously cannot do a lot of experiment with the Uh, the course which has to be taught because we are guided by BCI and other regulatory bodies, but uh, we can have this choice experience in the other uh, assignments that we give to the students, like research, and this will also help the students to learn to respect the diversity, and it will also help the student to develop according to their capacity. As Ma'am was also mentioning, that we should always keep in mind the diverse background from where the students might be coming to the class. so we cannot treat them as a homogeneous group but the teach as a law teacher we should respect and understand the various needs of the students and we can probably design our curriculum to take as many students together as we can the next skill which is required in the youth of today is to work collaboratively which will require a lot of respect for difference of opinion and also the diversity so collaborative approach also we can use while uh, teaching a course in which we can encourage our students to give us inputs as to what they want and how they want the lecturer or the teacher to be delivering in the class so that kind of collaborative way in which this is a way in which we th this teaching can be a learning exercise for both the uh, law teachers as well as for the student as well so it we should always be happy to take feedback from the students and uh, the peers that we have in order to develop our course curriculum uh, and keep updating it with whatever inputs the students are bringing to us very important for collaborativeness is the communication skills this is also something which is very important a skill which a student law, not just a law student but i think every all youth of a country or all across the world is required to work upon um, uh, building a positive communication neutral communication uh, sharing respect giving respect to different ideas um, and healthy communication building healthy communication in the class with the student by the teacher and all of these are some skills which i think can be worked upon uh, the best thing is uh, we generally learn by example so students we don't realize it too much but teachers are the first role model of legal professionals for the students so we can set an example of the language that we will be using for the students to emulate us and next is critical thinking Well, obviously this is one of the very important skill analytical critical thinking which students have so once we teach them how to work in a group uh, obviously they will be able to develop a, a knack for critical thinking on a on a particular topic so i think we need to move beyond the pedagogy model to andragogy model where we are still um, uh, most of us are still focused on teach, teaching which is more memory based so our students they are not at all required now don't, don't require the facts as all the speakers have been speaking about so we should also move towards andragogy and hotogogy which is there in which the teacher we just not have to focus on teaching but we can assume other roles like mentoring students um being uh, their coaches being there uh, being there to inspire them to work in to learn to work in group learn to respect the opinion of others and as, as well as to teach them how to think creatively out of the box because in the morning session if you were there judges have raised certain concerns that um, there is a issue of uh, pendency which is there uh, there is a issue of fair as i was mentioning fairness and justice oriented legal education so uh, these are things which require a lot of creative thinking we are not just there to produce legal scholars who will be able to join the bench bar or any other pro pro profession but we should be able to enable them to think creatively about the already existing problems that we are facing in the world and the, in there the role of the law teacher comes in we are there we should be there to support them to start thinking 
rather than just learning mugging and writing the exams that should not be the goal of the student to just get a degree from a case law university or a, any law university for that matter but we should be able to make thinking mature uh, product students who are able to handle the real life problems for that obviously as everybody is mentioning that we should have certain practical components added so in pure jurisprudence course also we can have certain practical inputs by which we can tell the student how the current real life problems can be solved by um, following those age old theories of jurisprudence so that kind of integration obviously is required which require law school teachers also to keep on uh, equipping themselves and updating their their understanding and understanding different methodologies uh, the experiments that can be done uh, the type of research assignments that can be given to students which obviously uh, because in i can give my example i was te i teach i teach clinic law clinic 1 which is alternative dispute resolution uh, code methods so in that generally we teach through simulation exercises so that's also one method in which we can teach the students the skills of adr so there i realized and for that students have to do role play so there i realized after one or two years that there are few students who are shy and they are not able to do a role play uh, and uh, secure good marks but they they may be exposed to do a general reflective general writing so that kind of experiment i, I did that and the students were very happy because they were very shy they were not able to speak obviously i know they have to speak but then role play is a kind of acting that they have to do it's not just a presentation so then they wrote very good reflective journals in which they showed how they applied the adr processes in their real life so that was what that is a kind of experiment which we can do with our students the last which is required of a law teacher is uh, or for that matter any teacher and another a uh, very important area skill is caring so the teacher so students will remember teachers if the teachers are able to empathize with them uh, and are available to them i know everybody all of us have very busy schedules uh, but we we are, have always should remember in mind that the students emulate us so if we prioritize if we keep a time table if we keep a schedule we may be able to produce lawyers who may be more punctual who who know how to prioritize things and how to prioritize time and so this caring out of the class interaction with the students uh, out, that plays a very important role relationship building also happen through these kind of interaction with the student and the teachers so i think these are some of the skills i can go on and on but these are some important skills which um, the law students should imbibe as well as the law teachers may use during their interaction with the students thank you, you ma'am that was really helpful and that brings me to professor gupta and uh, you know professor gupta as a member of the legal education space young law teachers often rely on just sheer osmosis and learning on the job to kind of gain really key skills given that there's very little in terms of an entry sort of barrier or entry step into becoming a law educator so how can this issue be addressed and should there be a training program for law teachers and if yes then what are the must haves for such a program so thank you for having me uh, excellent questions so when i entered the legal academia i remember it was not very clear to me as to what is my job description because you see if you are a professor uh, in an engineering college you are transmitting the domain knowledge of engineering to students right if you are a professor in a medical college you are transmitting the medical knowledge so it's just a transfer of domain knowledge but it can never be the sole job of the law teacher to transmit the domain knowledge of law because after all i mean everybody is supposed to know the law right and even if i don't go to that extreme at least five six professions would have good grasp of the domain knowledge of law like uh, professions like accountancy law enforcement then uh, many consultancy services tax consultants so and so they know the law so just teaching the law cannot be it 
So I was told that uh, we have to actually convey to them a very cognitive framework which is called thinking like a lawyer, right? So I interpreted this as to mean, uh, not, it cannot mean just thinking like some abstract lawyer in an abstract world who sits next to the reasonable man in the Clapham omnibus, but an actual lawyer who exists and how he might visualize the world, how he might look into the rules, right? So I had one uh, advantage which I think is uh, most of the legal faculties of lack, which is that I came from practice. So I have, I mean, I have, I was already thinking somewhat like a lawyer. So it was easier for me to, uh, I mean, I was there, one step there. But then the next step was more difficult. As Ma'am rightly pointed out, that traditionally the legal academia has uh, emphasized too much on the rational dialectical skills, right? They have not really taught us communication. They have not really taught us uh, how to enter into a person's cognitive and affective framework, right? So we don't actually look into the students and think, well, what is that guy thinking? Like if some, st uh, like earlier in my profession, if in my teaching career, I would have students approach me and say, sir, please don't take Viva because I have anxiety issues. I would just say, listen, man, you have to be a lawyer. So you just man up and do it. Right. So uh, and generally, I was also uh, kind of insensitive to the fact that many of the students seems to be thinking in their native language and translating it into English. And I understood this later uh, as time progressed. Right? So that's one. Secondly, uh, the question that comes that, uh, I, I mean, if you are communicating, what is the level of communication? So, of course, as a lawyer, my uh, tendency was to communicate at the clear level. Like, I am talking to someone who I think will be able to take my message or make the effort to just read up and understand it. That, of course, does not work because you are not talking to a peer. But I would also discourage, uh, some, as some people do, do not super simplify it also. Like for example, I remember one of my colleagues who got a very high feedback from the students. She told that what is res judicata? Res judicata is just don't do it again. Right? Okay. So you have to keep it somewhere in the middle. Right? I, am, uh, I don't know if you have seen in YouTube, there is this very interesting program. There is this um, uh, qualified, um, uh, a qualified physicist who is in CERN, uh, uh, explains quantum mechanics first to a five-year-old, then to an eighth grader, then to a bachelor's of science, then to a PhD holder, right? So as a teacher, you have to develop that skill where you can convey the message at various levels of receptibility, right? Now see, when I entered the profession, I think it was much easier. Now the task of the legal teacher is much worse, why? because of the newer competency models that have come. We were just taught, ki, well, uh, your student need to ultimately think like a, a lawyer. He needs to become what the American literature called a professional, in a sense that he needs to have the commitment to public service ethics and the competence. Okay, great. So now the new models <coughs> goes much farther. You have all these geometric ideas coming up. This is called the T-shaped lawyer. So this T is legal knowledge. And this crossbar is a lot of things, uh, including innovation, project managing, uh, risk assessment, accountancy, finance, right? And then there's the data model, the three arms being legal skills, uh, emotional intelligence, that is the soft skills, and technology, right? Is it humanly possible for a person to convey all these skills all at the same time? The straight answer is no. So what the law teacher needs to do is to start, get comfortable with this idea that he or she has to work with other professionals from other fields and have to incorporate their inputs into this, uh, into the classroom. So basically the legal law teacher in India, how it operated, used to work in silos, right? Silos not only from other uh, professions or other disciplines, but also from the legal profession itself. I mean, there are issues as to why this developed. There are regulatory issues also, but that how it used to be. So we need to break the silos. 
And the question is, uh, should we have some kind of a structured program for training for law teachers? This seems to be a very tempting idea, but let me also uh, red flag some of the concerns that I would have. First concern would be that this is going to basically, uh, I mean, please understand that most Indian law schools, in fact, most Indian universities, work under shortage of faculty. Now, if you are putting more and more threshold conditions, you are actually going to increase, I mean, this is going to reflect in your fees. That's one. Number two, I do not think, I mean, I, I hope that it won't affect it don't uh, sort of reinforce that silo effect, right? So if I have a situation where I have a law teacher who is trained specifically for that job, uh, now becomes um, now comes to the conclusion that he knows it everything and does not need to work with anybody else or look anywhere else, right? That also should not happen. So the legal teacher competency model that I would advocate is something similar to what they have in the IT industry. You see, in IT industry, what they do is that they have this structured process-based training. Like, you suppose change a company, you go from Cognizant to Accenture, they'll train you again. Why? They'll just train you in the way the company works. And all through your career, you take this short courses and you keep upskilling yourself, right? So that, uh, the parallel to that would be uh, in our, um, continuous legal education, right? So we can have a similar paradigm for law teachers as well, like you develop, and of course we should have enough uh, experience sharing, like in general we used to have, and we still have, uh, we call them the professional development workshops where senior faculty members come and interact with the junior teachers. I think that was tremendously helpful. Uh, though I must also warn you that uh, when you learn through osmosis, that is also a dangerous process because a uh, short anecdote i was told by one very senior professor from delhi university that uh, you never use slides in class why because if you use, use slides the students will lose this capacity for attention and they'll simply write from your slides and don't go through the readings so i followed that and uh, there's tremendous student dissatisfaction with that because they wanted slides they wanted speaking slides also. So one day one class rep, rep comes and tells me, sir, you don't give slides and this and that. I said, uh, this is my logic. So I said, why is it any worse to write from your slide than it is from to write a dookie book? That's one. And secondly, please understand this, that our generation of students, I mean, we are very visual people. Unless we get a visual cue, we cannot locate it, right? So basically, we are losing track of your class if you are not using slides. It's not about the quality of your teaching. It's not about the quality of knowledge. It's not about you. It's about us. Please respect that. Right? So, I mean, if I just borrow somebody's experience, that's also dangerous. But I think that also helps. Finally, the question is, uh, uh, I should like to end with Elon Musk. So according to Mr. Musk, that you can learn everything free of cost from YouTube or maybe download a book from Amazon, right, whatever way. So I did that experiment with stock investing in the break. And I am happy to tell you, I've lost only 20,000 rupees so far, <laughs> right? But there is a point. The point is making that there is a lot of information out there that a willing person can absorb. So if that is the case, what is the role of the teacher? I think it's very simple. The role of the teacher is to show the patterns in the information. That unlike an AI, a human mind, unaided, cannot always see the patterns. Right? For you to show the patterns, therefore, you need to have this knowledge you also need to be able to understand your subject and you need to become innovative, right? If technological tools are there, we should totally use them, right? We should not fear that it is dumbing down someone or it is, I mean, it's not kosher, it's not classy enough, it's not nothing like that. Any technology, including social media, should be used. Anything that reaches out to the student is good. 
Okay, so I am actually now in a very august and very uh, senior company. So, uh, so th these are my two cents. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, um, you know, with an eye on the time that we have left, I am asked to open the, the forum to any questions from the audience that you might have for our panelists today. I have time for maybe one or two more questions from the audience and then we shall break. Hi, my name is Ashwarya Chaturvedi. I'm an assistant professor at OP Jindal Global University. Uh, thank you so much to all the panelists uh, for this wonderful discussion. As uh, Professor Gupta mentioned uh, about the importance or rather the opportunity to uh, practice before you enter into academia, it's a more of a comment than a question. Uh, so I also practiced uh, law for four years before entering into academia and uh, I find it extremely helpful because I'm able to share those practical experiences with my class and my students and I'm also able to tell them sometimes that even though this is the written law but this is how it's actually implemented. So uh, in your opinion how important it is for uh, legal scholars, academicians to have that sort of uh, experience of practice as well or is it okay that the two fields continue to be disconnected? I just, I just want to mention one thing that I, you, you look around uh, in the top architecture schools, uh, top architects don't come and teach. Top lawyers don't come and teach in uh, law schools. No, no, you know, Ram Malani, you know, that, you know, I tell you, these kind of relationships with one person or two persons, uh, you know, these, these are, these cannot be, you know, kind of used as the normal because there is a huge difference in terms of the compensation levels. You, you, you have to be practical. Uh, in, in Yale and uh, Harvard Law Schools, they make it a point that every year, you know, either on sabbatical or on, you know, on, on a semester basis, they have at least four or five top guys from everywhere. And they make them fly when they have a case and other things and they are working with their teams. The kind of experience they create, we suffer from that. At the, at, I mean, uh, Symbiosis uh, has done a great job in many ways and uh, I think what she is doing is fantastic. But uh, they are lucky. Most schools suffer and there is no formal training for teachers either. And I, I don't want to, you know, deme I don't want to in any way disrespectful, but if you were a, if you were a very successful lawyer and if you enjoyed that profession, I don't think you will switch. Some of us switch out of our personal uh, likes and dislikes. Like uh, I always wanted to be a teacher right from the beginning. So that is, and I'm, I don't regret any of it. But then a lot of us uh, could have gone and taken up uh, corporate jobs. So that kind of choice is only, and uh, I'll just stop that. I just uh, my quick comment is uh, number one, uh, in, within our law school only, we can create practice avenues like community legal surveys or we can have consultancies. So why practice has to be always court centric? Solving a problem, uh, aiding uh, somebody who can't afford uh, legal remedy or being an entrepreneur in terms of getting what I call as the best practice of community legal service network. We created that in 27 villages. If they have any problem, we are there. We lie on with the District Legal Aid Services Authority. So there are, uh, and students are exposed. See, for us, best practices are there from management education. They are there from medical education. But we also have a council which has to open up itself and see. For example, it does not allow somebody in full-time practice. We are, we are asked to suspend our sanad. So, uh, I, when I started my career, my principal told, he was a practicing lawyer, he said, if it comes to that, let me see, because he was a very good lawyer. <laughs> so, uh, he protected us and he made it a point to send us to the court at least four hours a week. You know, we should also have in our compensation model, sir, 25% non-practice elements. Whether UGC has given that structure to the universities, 
So those who have sanad, who have kept their sanad under suspension, may then get a, a differential, I mean, what we call as a differential package. And the other point about training, I think uh, we have done that training. We structured it with beard and other points coming into it in design. A law teacher's com any teacher's competence plus a law teacher's competence. And Dr. Menon experimented with the uh, Menon's Academy for almost 10 years. I used to be a regular resource person. Some of you have met me also. But uh, we have to have the CLE model of Bar Council brought into the faculty. So some of our units, like we have Teaching Learning Resource Center, which conducts faculty development program. We have UGC's uh, refresher program, uh, uh, which is there in UGC as a mandate, which we could look at uh, modified into our context. So it all depends on initiative of the law schools and the universities, much more than that, you know. There is no one who stops you from taking initiative. But at the same time, why do we want every time somebody to tell us? So I am coming to the core point. Our mind is wrapped in hierarchy. We, unless we break that hierarchy, that somebody has to tell us, to get up somebody, my teachers, I have to remind them, where is your weekly report? Until then, nobody walks into my cabin or puts in my email here that this is my weekly report, this is the challenge I face, this is the best thing that happened. I want to know, is there a star among the students? Is there someone who is suffering? As the head of the institute, I am responsible as well. So they are my primary interface with my important stakeholders, namely the students. So a law teacher as an entrepreneur who doesn't, who doesn't, if that teacher falls short of skills, doesn't shy away from providing that skill to this centerpiece that is a student by bringing all the network, pressing it into service like how the entrepreneurial energy in management schools works. For instance, in my that is the advantage. My background of science has been a major advantage in bringing the medical education rationality. So on that basis, I would suggest that we should create a curriculum before we walk out of this uh, hall. Looking at the best practices and in the second half discussion, if that could come, in pressing um, AI and other tools so to see that without moving. You said that somebody said so much of workload, there is shortage. Yes, I agree. There is a deficit of 40% in professor and associate professor level across all universities and particularly in law school in this country. So if you are looking at that, whether you can have it as online and hybrid, once in a while immersion like this in the lead law schools and then practical program. I created a teaching internship program and one of the girls I trained later joined Jindal and now she's teaching abroad. So it's, it's, uh, it's also the initiative that you take in terms of grooming next level of human resource, which is your responsibility as lawyers, mentor the lawyers, bar. I remember in uh, Dublin, bar dinners were only to mentor. They were meant to be teaching the etiquette, teaching the thinking, teaching the mannerism, teaching network. We should do that here. That's very in the West. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And I think on that note, uh, so you have uh, just uh, one point. See, um, you are absolutely correct that that helps a lot. Do you see, in Indian uh, law schools, we have basically Madam rightly pointed out, this practice of suspending sanans means that uh, practicing lawyers would not want to teach. And it's not even about money because after a point of time, I mean, a senior uh, advocate, they earn so much. I mean, money is for them not really the thing. They can give a bit of their time also. But the point is, this sanad, uh, I mean, uh, more than the actual Difficulty it creates, probably it creates a sort of psychological divide between the two, right? A lawyer and that actually is very toxic because it reflects into uh, sort of uh, detachment and it's sort of, uh, I, I shall say that uh, uh, license. And uh, that's also interesting. I tried to uh, uh, suspend my son and they did not know what to do. And so it's still there. The point is... <laughs> that the lawyers believe that the academics are just those people, just a talk shop and in a court when you hear something being called an academic discussion, they are not trying to be polite to you. They mean that this is nonsense, please stop this. Right? We, we need to get over this problem. Thank you. And on that note, I think we need to conclude today.
today's discussion. Thank you to my fantastic panelists and to a wonderful audience. It's been very nice. Thank you so much.